All right, I want to welcome on my next guest. We got a very special guest. We have free agent running back, Super Bowl champion running back of the Seattle Seahawks. We have Mr. Robert Turbin. Robert, everything going for you? Everything is good, man. I'm retired now. You know, oh, you I'm are? Retired. It's official. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, not, not you know, I haven't submitted the paperwork yet. But okay. Like, you know, I didn't play this season. And, and for, you know, for reasons uh, uncontrollable to me, right, COVID and everything like that kind of put a hit on roster opportunities for older and young, young guys, unfortunately. But, uh, but that's the nature of the beast. That's the world we're living in right now. But, uh, but yeah, man, you know, it's, it, it comes for everybody. You know, it sucks, but it comes for everybody. And uh, the important thing is to, you know, kind of have something that you want to do when it's, when it's time to move on. And I saw, speaking of that, I saw you've been doing some analyst work in Sacramento for the CBS station. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Started covering games, post-game analysis okay. uh, for, uh, you know, mostly football games. And we've been had an opportunity to talk like some of the things going on demographically, like with junior colleges and how COVID's affecting just sports in California in general, especially for the youth. And we've had an opportunity to talk a little bit of basketball. I talk about basketball all day. You know, we talked about the Kings a little bit and what they got going on uh, with their team and stuff like that. But mostly it's football and, um, you know, the the entertainment side of, uh, uh, you know, of, of my career, you know, doing radio early in my career when I was in Seattle, doing TV when I was in Indianapolis, uh, you know, those are two avenues that I've certainly wanted to exercise uh, once I did retire officially from the game. And so, you know, I've really been blessed to meet some really, really cool people who have given me the opportunity to be a part of these industries um, and, and really, you know, have a foot in the door uh, as it pertains uh, to my next career. Yeah. So I want to ask you about your time in Seattle. You guys won the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. You beat the Broncos. What was that whole experience like? It was magical, man. I mean, it was just, uh, you know, this is what you dream about, man. You know, I, my first infatuation came uh, talking about New York City, you know, some about New York City, the bright lights and broad. Was that where that game was? Was that the, that was the New York City Super Bowl? It was in New York City. Yeah, it was Damn. in New York City, man. And so I had never been before. Uh, I don't think we, I don't think we played. Maybe we played the Giants earlier in that year, uh, but the stadium is in New Jersey, you know. So, uh, so New York City, I was always infatuated by it. I think that it it came from Home Alone too. Might have been like my first. Uh, you know, kind of look at, at the city of New York and, you know, from a distance or whatever, kind of imagining how it would be, you know, as a young kid or whatever, right? And uh, I always wanted to go and, and I always wanted to visit. So so my first experience being there and, and it being the Super Bowl was just like, you know, it was magical, you know, and then obviously being a part of that game, playing in that game and having some success in that game and dominating the way that we did. Uh, was just, a, you know, it was a dream come true. You know, all the little things, the confetti and the stage and, uh, you know, you've seen it so many times on TV, but to, but to, but to experience it in, in, in person is just, uh, I mean, it's, it's a once in a lifetime thing. And as you grow in your career, you grow to be, you can see my Super Bowl ring right there behind me. Uh, oh, that's pretty uh, good, sweet. Yeah. Uh, but as you, as you grow in your career, uh, you become even more, uh, so appreciative, right? Because here I am, right? I'm, I, I'm on that, you know, I'm done playing football now, eight seasons, you know, one ring, right? And, you know, it, it's like, it's, it's so uncommon. Like you would think it's so common to be a champion because somebody wins it every year. You know, every year there's a champion. Uh, but then you realize as you meet more players that, shoot, man, guys, there's a lot of guys who ain't even made the playoffs, you know, like, I mean, they, they'll play 10, 11, 12, 15 years, never been to the playoffs, first time in the playoffs or something like that, you know, like granted a Super Bowl, you know, and so you become more appreciative, you grow more appreciative of it uh, as you continue to, uh, as you continue to play in the league, as you get older, uh, because it's just such a rare, you know, it's such a rare commodity. Yeah, and then so I was so being in Seattle, it's the loudest fan base in the NFL. I don't think there's any debate about that. What do you do? You think this year, since there was no fans there, you should be, what do you think that meant to the guys that are playing on the team this year? That like I, I, the the pumped in sound is is fine, but it's not this real thing. Yeah, yeah. Not only the loudest fan base in the league, but the best. 
I mean, you want to talk about a city that is going to fully embrace you. Uh, Seattle is Seattle, man. Like, it, it, you know, it's the most chill place you can, it's the most accepting place you can go. You know, it, it, no matter who, what kind of person you are, it's, 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 it's cool. It's all love. Uh, but, you know, at the beginning of the season, you know, we're talking about CBS, you know, they asked me about, uh, you know, wh- wh- what do I think about no fans in the stands? And obviously I feel like it would be, uh, it, it would have an effect on a, on, on a lot of teams. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in talking to players, they said, you know, after about week four or five, they got used to it. But I, I felt like it would affect a lot of teams. That t- I, and, and I said this, too. I said, you know, the team that I feel like it will affect most is Seattle. I feel like, you know, they are the, the, the one team in the league that really feeds off of that energy of the crowd. I mean, it, it, you want to talk about 12th man, like, you know, I've, it's like a cliche. It's a work. But like they really, they really feed off of that. It's weird, you know. Like they're they're really a part of the game, and I felt like they would really miss their fans. And I thought that they were going to have a down season because of it. Now they ended up proving me wrong, right? They go twelve and four. I think that that was their record this year, or eleven and five, one of the two, right? They they won a lot of games. They won the NFC West, you know. And so, you know, then I'm sitting there looking, I was like, well, I guess, you know, maybe the fans, you know, maybe the fans not being there isn't, you know, uh, uh, affecting them the way that I thought it would. But then we get to that playoff game against the Rams, you know, and, you know, one of the things that is is immensely noticeable, not only when you're watching as a fan, yeah. but uh, as a player as well, whether, whether you're a young guy, you know, just maybe your first couple of years in the league, or, or uh, a veteran, maybe somebody who's going to the playoffs for the first time and you're a veteran, that intensity in the playoffs is, is so much different than a regular season. I mean, it, it intensifies. I mean, it just goes up, you know, on a scale from one to 10, it goes up another 10, you know, in, in the playoffs. And Seattle not having that element, they, they missed that element in that game. And you could tell, you could tell they were dry, they were stale, you know, they were, you know, they were almost asleep throughout that entire game. And uh, it wouldn't have been that way if the 12s were in the stands. I can guarantee you that. Do you think they peaked too early? Because I remember the beginning of the season, everybody's talking about like Russell Wilson has never gotten an MVP, but then you got Metcalf's amazing chase down, which I think is the play of the year. People stop talking about it. Um, one of the highest scoring teams under the defense was a little bit susceptible, but they did bring in some pieces. You brought in, um, Carlos Dunlap, you, I know they had snacks Harrison, but they let him go, but the defense kind of got stout and then the offense started, started falling off a little bit. Did you kind of see it like, all right, they're going to get back there. Did you have a feeling like, all right, they, they might be in trouble. No, I thought they were going to rebound. Uh, but sometimes what happens is, you know, you, you, uh, you, you have this high, right? I mean, let's talk about the Steelers. I mean, the Steelers won 11 games in a row, <laughs> right? And they were dealing with a bunch of different things. They didn't have a buy, like, People aren't taking that into consideration. They didn't have a buy, you know, they, they got they, they, multiple games were delayed or whatever, but nevertheless, you know, they were 11 and 0 and then, and then they, and then they lost. Right. And then, and then they, and then they kind of, then they kind of, they lost again. Right. And it's just like, for whatever reason, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes if you allow it losing can almost make you second guess who you are. You know, like it, it, it can almost, it can shake your confidence a little bit. You know, and I think that's what happened to Seattle. They started off on this high, then they had a couple lot. I think they lost like two in a row. And then it's like, well, what are we doing? Are we doing the right thing? Are we calling the right plays? You know, and I could be wrong about this, but I'm just saying like, uh, you know, just from the outside looking in, it's just like, you know, that's how, what it seemed like to me. It seemed like, they just started like you got a couple losses and you start yeah. usually when you lose, right. You, if, if you know who you are, you believe who you just stick to that. Right. And, you, and you'll be able to bounce back. You'll be fine. Right. Like the Buccaneers, you know, they found ways to just bounce back and keep being who they are. And now they're in the NFC championship ship game. Right. But teams like the Steelers and the Seahawks, they, they kind of lost their way because they kind of start saying, once you start second guessing yourself, it, it almost becomes almost like a trend. And you start second guessing yourself all the time. You know, you start becoming insecure about, you know, 
what you're running, your, your play calling and, and, and what you're doing. And uh, you, 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 you know, you kind of lose your rhythm that way. So they moved on from Brian Schottenheimer. Um, did you see that as a surprise or do you think it was something that was going to happen? You know, I thought it was going to be 50, 50, you know, I, it, it wasn't going to surprise me e- either way. It, it wouldn't have surprised me if they kept him because he'd only been there, what, two seasons. This was only his second season. Right. And it wouldn't have surprised me. Uh, you know, it didn't surprise me that they let him go just because they were just so stale, uh, stagnated, um, you know, in that playoff game. And really, uh, throughout the second half, uh, you know, of the uh, of the season. Now, does that all fall on Coach Schoenheimer? Absolutely not, you know. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, you know, somebody has to take accountability, and that and that and that's really the sucky part about this business. I got one wild kind of kind of question that I'm, I'm very curious about. I probably know the answer, but I'll, I'll be hopefully I'm surprised. Does, does Macklem in, in your entire career with the Seahawks, did Macklemore ever come in there and hype you guys up pregame? Pre-game? Nah. Yeah. Because you guys would nah. you guys would never lose. Undefeated. Yeah. He nah, he, every- yeah. He 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 <laughs> he was more, you know, he'd come say what's up like after the game or whatever and meet us out or something like that. He'd, you know, do some stuff in the community with us, you know, but nah, he didn't do no pregame hype stuff. You know. <laughs> I was wondering, like it's like it was like Macklemore and Ryan Lewis and then just falls. Yeah, we, we had Kenny Chesney come in there one time, oh, no cool. hype us up. Yeah, yeah. Drake That's Drake all- came through, you know. Really? Drake went yeah. through. Oh, yeah, Jake cool. came through. Jake came through one time, hacked us up, man. It was cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I want to talk about your um to your early career. So I saw you're from California. How how the hell do you end up at uh, Utah State? Yeah, so Utah State came and recruited me. I wanted to. So my dream was to to be a running back. When I first started playing football at ten years old, uh, you know, I I wanted to be Barry Sanders. That's who I wanted to be like. You know, and so it was always my dream to play running back. I, I told my uh, Pop Warner coach that, uh, you know, I wanted to be number 33. And uh, and he asked me why. And I said, well, I want to be the first number 33 to be in the Hall of Fame, you know, in the NFL. And he laughed at me because obviously as a 10-year-old kid, I didn't know my history uh, as well as I thought I did. You know, the Tony, Do- Tony, Do- Tony Dorsett's of the world, number 33 and et cetera, et cetera. But uh when I got to high school, uh, you know, my high school had been in business, you know, for, uh, you know, 28, 30 years, something like that. Never, never sniffed the playoffs, never, you know, never did anything as a football team. Right. And, uh, you know, our class came in there and, uh, and we completely changed that. You know, we came in, we knew as freshmen when we came in, like, hey, man, when we get to varsity, you know, it ain't going to be the same old Irvington anymore. It's going to be different. You know, we're going to win games, and we did. You know, we won our we won our conference, and and we were conference champions, and we went to the state championship game. You know, we were conference champions two years in a row. Uh, and so Utah State was intriguing to me because you know, although you know Coach Aliotti at Oregon and and, and Coach Montgomery at University of Washington uh, were there, and and they wanted me to play for them. Uh, but, number one, they wanted me to play defense. I was a pretty good safety coming out too. Uh, but secondly, I just, you know, I felt like, um, you know, I felt like those teams would already be good with or without me. I wanted to go somewhere where I could really make a difference and have an effect on a program, leave a legacy, something that would last forever. And I'm not saying that I wouldn't have been able to do that at Oregon or Washington, but it's just like, I didn't, I didn't really feel like they needed me, you know? At Utah State, I felt like, I, I felt like they needed, not necessarily me, but somebody with, with a winning mindset. They've been losing for so many years. I wanted to take on that challenge. I like being the underdog, you know? I wanted to go somewhere where, you know, I felt like I could really make a difference. Somebody that needed a winning mentality uh, uh, to help, you know, kind of transform that program. And so, uh, and so without really knowledge of the state of Utah and how it is or whatever, you know, I, I, I chose Utah State. I chose Utah State. That's awesome. I have a qu- question. Is, is Utah State the off-campus life? Is it underrated or what people think it is? It's what people think it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's you're what like, people damn, think it is, man. Like off-season, you're, you're like, like, damn, what the hell are we going to do? All right, yeah. no. 
That's yeah. wild. Now at, at University of Utah might be a little different because they're in Salt Lake City. Okay. So that, that so their lifestyle might be a little underrated, you know. But where we were, it's 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 exactly what you probably think it is. And then compared to BYU, you guys are probably like Arizona State. So yeah. So no, you know, probably, yeah, maybe a little bit. You ain't doing nothing over there. <laughs> you get kicked out of school at BYU. Yeah. Zach Wilson's gonna have some fun next year. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question. When did you meet Bobby Wagner? Because it's wild. You guys both played at Utah State and then you eventually both went in the same draft class to Seattle. Yeah. So I was a freshman. I came in as a freshman in 2007 and he came in as a freshman in 2008. And um, we were, uh, shit, man, we were just, we were teammates that, that next year in 2009, we grew really, really close. We both took responsibilities for uh, our side of the ball uh, and being leaders of the team. You know, I was more vocal. And uh, he was more of a guy that led by example. Uh, but, you know, we, we had the, you know, we had the connection to where we were like, you know, you know, we're going to lead this team. We're going to lead this team together. And, uh, and that grew over 2009, 2010, and 2011, which ended up being our last season at Utah cool. State. I have a question. What was, your, what was your draft process like? It was, uh, I mean, that draft process is, I mean, it's crazy, man, because it's just like your season ends and, and it's, and then you go, you straight to it, man. You sign, you sign an agent, you know, your agent gets you set up for combine training and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, you, you, you might get a week, you know, uh, of rest, uh, if that, and obviously like you can choose, but then again, you don't want to be behind the eight ball, you know, when it's time to, you know, when it's time to perform and, uh, and so, uh, you know, you get right to it, man. You go, you go, you go to where you're going to train. I went to Arizona and trained at uh, what used to be Athletic Performance Institute. Now it's called Exos. Uh, I went out there and I trained in, in, at the Phoenix facility there. I got ready for the for the combine and worked out. Got myself ready. You know, then then you then you you know you perform at the combine and uh, and then uh, then you essentially you know it's kind of a waiting game, right? You train, you keep yourself in shape, and uh, you. Uh, you wait till the draft day. You, uh, even before then, you got to do your pro day too, right? So you got your combine, boom, boom. Then you got to keep training because you got to, you know, if there was something that you didn't do well at the combine, you want to redo it at the pro day, right? So, this, you know, for the scouts and everything like that. And so it was preparation for the pro day, but everything was just boom, 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 boom. There was no, there's no, there's no break. And then, um, and then, you know, finally, you know, you get to go home and, and kind of wait to see where you're going to go, you know? I was really confident coming out of, uh, coming out of the, uh, the combine. I, you know, listen, I didn't, I didn't run the fastest 40, but I ran a four, four, four. That's, that's fucking fast for somebody who's over 220. And, uh, and, you know, I, 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 you know, I repped the bench press 30, you know, 30 times. Now, if you, if you Google it, it'll say 28, but I got 30. Okay. They cheated me out of two, you know, my vertical was a 36. I, I forget what my broad jump was. I think it was like a, a 10 one, it might've been even under 10. I don't think I did great in the broad jump, but I felt like I did, you know, fantastic in all the drills, all the little cone drills. I didn't drop a ball. I felt like I was the best. There were eight running backs taken before me. Uh, and there was no doubt in my mind that I was better than, you know, Trent Richardson who went first. Um, AAF legend, Trent Richardson. <laughs> Is that is that is that what he is now? To me, that first day of the AAF was fantastic, and then I was like, you know what? Oh man, I'll see what else is on. Yeah, Trent Richardson, <laughs> uh, David Wilson, Doug Martin, you know, uh, Michael James, Isaiah Peed, uh, well, who was it? Bernard Pierce. Uh, uh, who were the other guys? Who, yeah, yeah, he went to Baltimore. Yeah, I know. I, uh, I so about about uh, Bernard Pierce. Temple. Yeah, he because I remember. I, I, my mother's catering company does all the food for the Ravens in the summer. I think it was my uh -huh. sophomore year. I worked in the kitchen, just kind of doing stuff. And just the guys were just doing their own thing. It was the okay. summer of the, the Ray Rice situation. That was interesting. That's not going to talk about that. That was interesting. Cause I was in uh -huh. the room. I was in the dining room when he came out after the initial press conference before the video, but Bernard oh, Pierce wow. was on the team. This dude is fluent in Spanish was talking to us behind the counter. He's like telling me ordering it in Spanish. I'm like, this dude what? is unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, him and Dennis Pitta, fluent in Spanish. Unbelievable. Lots of fun. It was wild. I don't that's know. I, can, I know numbers and colors. That's it. That's what they talk about. Yeah. That, yeah, that's, that's unbelievable. And I have a question. So I, I, I got a couple of questions from, from some Seahawks fans. And there's one of them that keeps coming up. Um, what arm workout do you do? Because I've gotten that from 15 people. 
<laughs> um, I, I, I do the same arm workout as everybody else. I just started early. <laughs> I just started early. Like, like Metcalf, did. Metcalf workout early or like not that early? Because I know he was doing it like six. Yes. Really? Yeah, like like pull ups in the closet, six years old, push ups. <laughs> you want Legos? Yeah. Nah, give me an arm bar and we're good to go. Let's do it. Yeah, man. You just started, I started <laughs> early and I was just buff. I just was just always like, even in elementary school, I had like big biceps. That's wild. I have a question. So when you get to Seattle, do you remember your first time meeting Marshawn Lynch, who I, I've been saying it forever. I think he should replace Alex Trebek when they find a full-time host. I think he should be the new host of Jeopardy. I think it'd be the best show on TV. <laughs> oh my God. I can tell you an out, I can tell you're an outside the box thinker. Like you just Yeah. I'm you just, you you, I, I saw him on Peyton's places. He's on Conan O'Brien all the time. I saw him Oh my the, gosh. Bring it up to him. Do you know bring, bring it up to him? That would be that yeah, I bring, am. I'm, a, I'm actually I'm gonna text him right now. All I'm right, say, bring it up to him. I think it would be electric. Funny. Yeah. That is funny he's the most likable oh, nfl oh. personality in <laughs> years and he would be the best there's so much crap on tv get marshawn yeah, on there that is he'll be funny. aaron Rodgers. nobody wants to see aaron Rodgers on tv come on no nah, they don't want to we see want marshawn we want shit. marshawn yeah, yeah that's no. funny As I was nah, watching, he was sitting at his locker man i walked up to him and introduced myself i told him that uh you know he's one of my favorite running backs because uh, he was you know I, I i looked up to him from a distance and uh, you know, I was grateful for the opportunity to be teammates with him because we were both from the Bay, you know? Yeah. And so we had that in common. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I just walked up to him. He's sitting at his locker room and, uh, you know, I introduced myself. I, I wanted him to know that I was a hard worker and, uh, and I was a team first guy, man. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I was excited to work together. Yeah. What, what kind of things did he kind of show you early on that you were like, that, that made your game better? Just, you know, Man, he just led by example, man. Just just the way that he uh, played, you know? Like, he was just always ready to play. You don't know how, you know, like, you know, uh, but uh, he didn't always, you know, give up his, uh, you know, his routines and, 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 and those sorts of things. But, uh, you know, he was just always ready to play, man. And, uh, and you had to be, you know, because in this league, you know, they're always, you know, they're always looking at the next yeah. guy, you know, and, uh, and, and one, one thing Marshawn, man, is, he, you know, he made it hard to look, he made it hard, you know, to look at the next guy because he was always ready to play, you know, yeah. and, and, and so I, I, I took that with me throughout my career. And so speaking of the next guy, so the current guys they have now, you got Chris Karsh and Rashad Penny. I'm not sure if Carlos Hyde's still on the team. And then you got DJ Dallas. What do you think of their RB group right now? Uh, they're fantastic. I mean, they got a good group of guys, you know, uh, you know, they, they got some decisions to make, right. Because Carson's a free agent and uh, Carlos Hyde is a free agent and uh, Penny's kind of struggled to stay healthy. And they got the young kid and, 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 uh, and DJ Dallas. Uh, and they also signed some guys, you know, towards the end of the year that, that did well for him. Um, the, the kid, uh, they, they had a, I can't think of his name right now. But he like a Procise? I feel like Procise has been on there for 15 no, years. No, not Procise. He, this is the dreadhead guy who was a uh, dark visor. Oh, I know you're talking. Yeah, I, can't think yeah, of I know you're talking about. Oh, so Alex Collins. Alex Collins. Alex Collins. There you I go. got a funny, Alex I got a story about Alex Collins too. I'm going to yeah. leave that up when I too. Yeah, I'm Alex Collins. <laughs> they, they signed it. They, they went and got a BJ. I think his first name is BJ, but Scar Scarborough from the Oh, you're yeah, from, from Alabama? Well, he was with the Lions. You know? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't remember what college he went to, and so you know, so they, they, they I mean, and Alex Collins came in and did a fantastic job. Yeah. So they, uh, you know, they have some decisions to make at that at that spot. Uh, I don't think it's going to be like a priority for them because, uh, you know, I hate to say it, I, you know, I, I don't think it's easy to find running backs, but you, you can certainly, you know, you can certainly find a, a runner, you know. Uh, and so, uh, but yeah, I, I, I like their group. I, I really do. Awesome. I have a question. What kind of gum does Pete Carroll chew? You know what? I wish, I don't know. I have no idea. Really? I've never seen him without gum. Whatever I've it never... is, he likes it a lot. Unbelievable. Same That's way. Yeah, I, have a, I have a question. Who is the hardest guy for you to match up with in the NFL? Like when you guys are playing their team, you're like, damn, this is going to be a, this is going to be a long day. Oh man. That's a, that's a good question too. Uh, you know, who was it that we just always, that is just, 
always played us tough. You know, I, I, I would have to, I'd probably have to look in our division. It, it, it's just, it was just like the Niners at that time with, 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 uh, you know, Bowman and, 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 and that defense that they had at the time yeah. and the Rams, even though they sucked, they just always, they had a good defense all the time, bro. And, and the Cardinals, the Cardinals weren't very good either, but they, they did so many dynamic things uh, defensively. Like they, 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 they like to bring, you know, different kinds of pressures and different looks and stuff like that. They really like to, they really like to confuse you uh, up front and stuff like that. So, you know, I, I would have to say, man, the teams within our division were always, were always tough matchups. I have a question. I normally ask you guys to play in the NFC East, but I'm pretty sure you played against them. Do you have any, ever have any interesting experiences uh, playing against the Eagles at, in, at length, at the, at the, at the length? Uh, they were booing their own team. They were not happy. <laughs> they who were not that, happy. Who was I talking to the other day? I forget. Somebody, who was I? Oh, um, oh, he's talking to a former Washington quarterback, uh, Gus Farrow. And he said, oh, okay. he, told, he said he told his family members, don't wear my jersey when you go to the game. Yeah, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. I'll tell you what, you don't want to do that at a Raiders uh, stadium either in Oakland. I mean, you, huh? you, you, you go to Oakland and you got, you, you, just, you got the Niners or whoever kind of, it, it's, it, you know, it's, you're liable to get yourself into a fight for sure. That's unbelievable. I have a question. In your opinion, who's the best back in the league today? Wow. That's a that's a that's a tough. That's a really. Because so many guys question. that were hurt this year that I feel like it's just a weird year to, for that question. Yeah, but I wouldn't. You know, I, I yeah, I wouldn't say Saquon is the best. Um, yeah, I I don't remember who else who else was. Injured. McCaffrey played like three games. McCaffrey would be would be very close, would be very close at the top, in my opinion. Um, but. I think I have to give the nod to Henry right now. I think, I think, I think Derrick Henry, I think he's the number one back uh, in the league, in my opinion, Uh, because he, you know, yeah, you know, he's not like dynamic where he's going to line up and, 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 and run an option route out of the backfield. Right. You know, he's, he's not, you know, he'll catch a swing route or a flat route, you know, some of the basic, running back routes, but, uh, but when it, you know, when it comes to running the ball, he, he breaks tackles, he makes people miss and he has breakaway speed. That's like, that's like the key. Like, that's like when you can take some shit 60 to the house, that's what really, you know, that's what really separates you. That's what really separates you, man. Um, And so I got to give the nod. I like Henry, man. I like Henry. You think he's better than what Brandon Jacobs was? What? Brandon, ja- Brandon, Brandon Jacobs. Jacobs. In terms of big backs. <laughs> Man, Brandon Jacobs is not even in the same sentence as Derrick Henry, bro. <laughs> it's not uh, that, even that, close. That, yeah, that's interesting. And that's, un- that's unbelievable. And then, so I have a question. So when you when you moved on from Seattle and kind of, we were kind of going around the league, what was your kind of mindset, just kind of staying ready just for the next opportunity? Yeah, when Seattle released me, I was, you know, I was really shocked. Um, and I was really disappointed uh, because – I really, in my mind and in my heart and in my soul, I wanted to be the guy that, uh, you know, that that kind of became the lead back after Marshawn. I felt like I, I had the, uh, you know, the ability to do that. I was ready for it. Um, but I think I may, I, I think I may have made some mistakes as a young player. You know, some decisions within the organization that they, you know, that perhaps that they didn't like, and um, and you know, and it made it maybe made it easier to part ways. You know, I hurt my ankle in week three of that preseason. So I was going to be out for like the first four weeks of the season. And, you know, and when it comes to holding roster spots and stuff like that, you know, it's, it's a financial strain, right? You you know, other guys get injured. You got to fill those roster spots. You got to make those roster spots available, man. So they released me and uh, kind of a funny story. You know, when you get released, you get on waivers. So waivers is kind of like the draft, right? So the first, so the worst team to the best team gets to claim you off waivers uh, in that order. And Cleveland had the number one pick, you know, and, uh, and so they made a call to, uh, to my agent and, and my agent called me and said, you know, do you want to go to Cleveland? 
And I said, you know, I think you know the answer to that. And he said, the perfect good. answer. That's the perfect answer. <laughs> and he said, good, because I told him your chances of signing with them if you cleared waivers were slim to none. And I said, good. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. So uh, they ended up claiming me off waivers. Uh, so I was going to Cleveland and I was happy with it. I was like, okay, great. I'm going to Cleveland. I'm going to be the best. I'm going to be the best back here at Cleveland. I'm going to help change this program around. You know, I was, I was all positive mindset with it, but it didn't end up working out. So in that same season, 2015, you know, we agreed to part ways and I went to Dallas and going to Dallas was really a blessing because, you know, it didn't, they didn't have the best uh, facilities and things like I, mean, I thought Dallas would be a lot different than it was. It was actually like really like, uh, like it was aged, like their locker room and stuff like that. I was like, oh man, this is, whew. I mean, coming from Seattle, you know, this is just, but, uh, but, you know, I got to team up with, uh, uh, Darren McFadden, my guy, and uh, learned a lot from him and had some success. That success led me uh, to have an opportunity to go to Indy, which is where, uh, which was kind of my next long stint, uh, where I really was able to make a name for myself again. Were you, what was your reaction when um, Andrew Luck told everybody he was retiring? Yeah, I mean, I think I was just shocked. Uh, just like everybody else was, uh, but in a way, perhaps not, man. He, you know, he gave a lot of, he gave a lot of signals and signs beforehand, uh, just kind of just wasn't in it, you know, a, 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 as much as you would normally see, you know, and uh, I think, uh, I don't, I, you know, I think he wasn't happy with the timing and, and how it got announced and stuff like that, it getting leaked out. Um, but, um, listen, man, you know, this is a brutal game and, uh, you know, sometimes listen, you, you know, you make enough money and you just say, Hey, I'm good. Yeah. I got, I got one, one note about Cleveland. So I went, I went to visit my buddy in Chicago, not this past summer, the summer before. And we had a, uh, there was a stop in Cleveland and we get there and it's kind of a long ride. And I'm seeing if there's what's to eat. If you type in Cleveland, you type in the word Cleveland, then the next one is, or no, food in, if you type in food in Cleveland, the next word is airport, which means that more people are searching what food they have in the airport than in the city because they're just coming and going. But, wow. Well, I, well, I, well, yeah, yeah, that's funny. So, but you know what? I like Cleveland. I like okay. I like the city of Cleveland more than I did uh, Dallas. Oh, interesting. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. They, were, that's, they were building like a new, Cleveland was dope. They were building like a new little area downtown and stuff like that it, it was it was dope you got the rock and roll hall of fame which i didn't get to see all of them. yeah but it's, it's it's cool it's dope out there and then for an indie so you got you see uh jonathan taylor had a fantastic year what do you what do you think about his fit in that offense it's perfect he's a downhill runner he's patient he can read you know he can read uh read those holes and things like that um i think they got the i think they picked the perfect back man perfect back complimentary to uh you know, Naheem Hyde and some of those other guys that they have. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's he's definitely their runner of the future. What do you think they should do at QB? Well, I think that um, unless you can find, you know, somebody you feel like is better than Phillip Rivers or has the potential to be better than Phillip Rivers, I think you bring, you know, Phil back for another year uh, and uh, kind of, reassess after after the season after next season oh cool and i want to ask you so when you you then you go back to seattle what was that like just getting the call like hey we need you oh man i mean it was uh i can't even put it into words i mean i it was hard man you know I, you know just the 2018 the, the you know the way my the way my career ended in indy was just i mean it was just so disappointing after such a promising start you know i would have never thought in my wildest dreams that it would have ended that way. You know, it's, uh, it was, it was really, you know, it was really heartbreaking for me. And, and, and going into that next season, it was really tough, man, because, you know, there wasn't a lot of interest out there, you know, and it really surprised me going into that 2019 season that, uh, that it was just like, man, you know, I, you know, I thought I, I would at least, you know, be signed somewhere going into training camp, you know, I certainly trained and got myself ready and stuff like that. I wanted to bounce back, you know, as an athlete, whenever, whenever, you know, something negative happens, you know, 
you, you want to bounce back from it. You know, somebody catches a ball on you, you know, you, you know, you want to lock them up the next play, you know, uh, you know, somebody makes a tackle, you want to break the tackle. The next play. You're always looking to bounce back, man. And so after that injury, which was the worst play that I've ever had in football, which really put like even more on it, you know, like I, I've never had a play, a single play worse than that one, than my last play in Indy, never since I was 10, you know? And, uh, and so, yeah, not, not, not getting another opportunity was really eating at me, you know? So going to, going to see, I going back to Seattle, going back home where like, the, when I talked about the fans earlier in the show, right? I mean, just, they were just so, even when I was with other teams, they were always like, we love you turbo to, to you're always, you're always a 12, you know, the 12s love you, you know? So going back to Seattle and just being, uh, just embraced, you know, by that city and, and that community and that organization, it really, it really meant a lot, you know, it really meant a lot. And, uh, you know, I talked about that last play in Indy because I'm, I'm telling you, man, like it really was, I mean, it was a thorn, you know, and, uh, you know, a running backs coach, you know, really kind of helped me get over it. And, uh, and I was able to kind of rebound and, and do everything I could to help the team win a, win a championship. I have a question that in between period between um, leaving Indy and going to Seattle, were you putting feelers out or were you like reaching out to teams like, Hey, I'm, I'm ready. If oh, you need man. Me. All the time. I mean, I was, I trained my ass off, man. I'm not, listen, I tell people this, you know, um, that when whoever asks, you know, whenever I'm talking about, when, whenever I talk about my training, I tell people, you know, I may not be a hall of famer, but I, I you know, I can look you in the eye and I can look myself in the eye with with 100% confidence and tell you that I have Hall of Fame work ethic for sure like there's there's no doubt in my mind and that's why now that I that that my career is over you know like I you know I, I'm somewhat like I'm at peace because I know for a fact you know if I look myself in the mirror I'm talking to God you know I'm like I know when it as it pertains to work ethic and, and, and training and being ready and preparing myself to play, I know I was ready every time, without a doubt. I, I gave it everything. I gave it everything, all the hours, uh, multiple times a day, the nutrition, the, the, the taking care of the body and stuff like that. I'm telling you, man, I really, I really invested in it. 1000%, no doubt, no doubt. I have a question. So when the pandemic started and they're telling everybody, everybody stay home, don't do anything, be safe. So somebody with the drive, like that work ethic, you can't just turn it off. How do you manage? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I'm lucky because my trainers, they own their own gyms. Uh, and so, uh, you know, obviously I, I invested in like a home gym and I've got oh, the cool. treadmill and the bike downstairs and leg press and stuff like that in my garage and stuff like that. Uh, but the, just in case, but you know, my trainers, I have two trainers and uh, really three because uh, because I'd go three times a day, but they all own their gyms, uh, which, oh, is, cool. which is really which is really fantastic. And you don't really see that a lot. Uh, and so, you know, they were they were open to opening their doors for me still oh, cool. understanding what was at stake and the possibilities that were still out there for me. So, you know, we get up and we'd be up in there early in the morning, getting our work in. That's awesome. I just want to ask you about your podcast, Turbo Talk, uh, Turbo Talk, and how did you kind of come up with the title? How what do you, what do you what can people check out about it? Who, who are some of the guests you've had and are coming on the horizon? Yeah, so I was approached by this uh, company, this podcast network. Believe that they're dying. Oh, I'm actually on them. I'm on them now. Okay. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they approached me. It was like, hey, you want to do a podcast? And I was just like. Uh, I mean, I guess, I mean, I, you know, tell me more about it. I don't know, <laughs> you know, and, and so they kind of gave me the, you know, all the, all this, you know, things about it. And, uh, and we got started and everything like that. And we did our first episode on Radio Row at the Super Bowl in 2020. Oh, cool. And, uh, and it's good. I mean, we've had, I mean, we've had a lot of fantastic guests, you know, uh, I mean, we've, uh, it, 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 I mean, it's been really fun, you know, the, the Ken Griffey juniors of the world, you know, we've had, uh, you know, USA women's soccer players and WNBA players. And uh, even like, you know, we, we had a series of round tables and we had a five episode series where, you know, during like the George Floyd stuff, you know, we had police officers matched up with, with, with other athletes, you know, on the show so they could ask. So other athletes can ask specific questions to a cop or a teacher or an attorney, 
uh, uh, you know, even a judge, you know, uh, that we've had, you know, on these shows, man, to really just share perspectives on, uh, you know, on what they see, you know, their vantage point on, on, uh, on how they're looking at it and, and how they're making decisions and, uh, you know, and stuff like that, you know, it was really cool having a teacher there because, yeah. you know, she, she kind of talked about some of that stuff from, from a, you know, from a child standpoint that nobody was even thinking about, like, how is this affecting the youth? Nobody, was, nobody was talking about that at all. Yeah. Right. So you can check it out anywhere that you watch um, or listen to uh, podcasts. You can, you know, check out mine. It's Turbo Talk, and uh, you can actually watch it live. I do it live on Twitch. Uh, oh, cool. So uh, partner with Twitch at the Super Bowl and uh, a little bit after the Super Bowl, and so we have that platform, which is really cool. You know, I don't do a whole lot of gaming on there, at least not yet. Uh, we're still kind of putting some things together, but uh, but yeah, you know, it's fun. It's fun doing the podcast. And I just got one last question for you. Did, did Marshawn accept the Jeopardy inquiry or is he, is he still going to think about it? He's still, he's still thinking about yeah, it. He's still thinking about it? All right. Yeah, he's still thinking about All right. it. If he, I'm telling you, like, it, it'd be the biggest TV event outside of the Super Bowl, number two in ratings. I'm telling you, yeah, right there and there. Yeah. Well, sometimes you, I, that's what you need, man, because it's yeah. like, if you, think about it, if you think about a show like Family Feud. Yeah. Like before Steve Harvey, it was, you know, it was still fun, yeah. you know, because it was the original dude, right? But like, yeah. Man, you, you they do they do a little spice in there by yeah. you know having Steve Harvey host that thing, a couple of jokes. Marshall would be hella funny on that. <laughs> who was who was the guy that did an NFL players family oh feud? Oh god. They, they, did you see the one that was it um they do it, they Bruce, do a celebrity one. Did you see the, the Bruce Smith one? No, but you gotta see uh, the Stefan Diggs one. I didn't see that one. Now check it out. That's on that one is funny. He's Steve Harvey's. I think he's the next guy in line to get like a late night show because I think it's crazy that he doesn't have one. I think the question was finish this sentence. I, I, I. And it was leave it. <laughs> and this boy said in. He started looking around like <laughs> and like it if it like it fucked you know it fucked Steve Harvey up so bad he couldn't even finish like the time. The time ran out. He was trying to like say the next, and he was stuttering and shit. Because there was one more question to ask, and he was like, I, 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 he couldn't even get it out because he was like, he was like, wait a minute, what did, I, what did I just hear? The shit was funny, bro. It was a good one. How many points you get for the answer? You get any points for the answer? Uh, you know what? I didn't even watch that part. <laughs> like nobody even cared about that part. Shit was funny. Buffalo is like, all right, get get the GM on the phone. We want him here. We'll give him a first, right? Now, right be, after yeah. right after seeing that, yeah, yeah, yeah. It should have been the number one answer for sure. Yeah, it's it, it, it unbelievable. It's like this was the number one. Answer. That's unbelievable. That's a, and then um, how can people find you on social media? Follow you, keep up with you, follow you on Twitch, and just kind of keep up with whatever you're doing. Yeah, so my Twitch channel is twitch.tv slash Robert J Turbin. Robert J Turbin is uh, my middle name is James, so uh, like James Bond, but uh. You know, uh, Robert J. Turbin, man, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, my YouTube channel, Robert J. Turbin. Uh, not a whole lot going on right now, a whole lot of game planning going on right now oh, to cool. start the new year. Uh, but uh, we're going to be getting going here really soon, man. So, uh, you know, I, I would encourage everybody to come check us out. 